Hello, everybody, and welcome to another RCSI Cardiovascular Society ECG of the week. This week, we have a very interesting special case. Um, it's our first PEDS case, so let's uh, get starting with our clinical vignette, and you can just have a read there to re-familiarize yourself with the case. And now let's have a look at the ECG. So the same as every week, we're going to start with our six step method. I'm going to go right down into the rhythm strip and I'm going to determine the rate uh, for this patient. And uh, I'm just going to use the 10 second method today. But remember, you can use this or the 300 method. Um, and so we're going to count our ECG peaks. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Um, and so for our math on the rate using the 10-second method, remember we take the number of our, our peaks and we multiply it by 6 to get our beats per minute, and that's going to give us a rate of about 126 beats, beats per minute. Um, and just remember that you can also use the 300 method, and if you kind of zoom in here, if you're looking at this one right here, how many boxes is this away? One, two, um, not really quite three boxes, so somewhere the rate using the 300 method, if we do 300, we divide it by three or by two, this is equal to 100 beats per minute, but since it's not fully out of that third, it's really between um, 100 and 150 beats per minute, which is where we kind of found it with the 10 second method. So that's rate done. Uh, next thing to go to is to see, have a look at the rhythm and see if our rhythm is regular, irregular, or kind of what's going on there. And same as every week, uh, we're going to take the marks that I've made here on our R peaks, and then we're just going to transfer them over to subsequent R peaks and see if they line up. And it's looking like, yeah, they line up pretty well there, uh, kind of across the board. So it looks like we have a sinus rhythm uh, for uh, this ECG. Next thing to go to do is look for our P waves. Now, uh, you can look uh, continue looking at the rhythm strip. So here we're seeing, uh, start at the right beginning, a little bit tough to see. They're very small in lead two, but yes, we have P waves here uh, going across the entire tracing. Um, and then of course, we'd like to see that our P waves are followed by QRS complexes. Um, I'm going to bring you actually into this continuous a strip of uh, V1, which is right here, and show you kind of what you're looking at here um, with P waves. Again, you are seeing P waves, uh, but you might notice something about the shape. We don't talk a lot about morphology of our P waves, but that is very important. Um, they look much taller, even if you compare them to the P waves that are kind of hiding tiny little things here in lead three. But if you look across the ECG, I'll zoom into kind of this section, uh, you'll see that you have these like really high kind of pointy, tall T, uh, P waves there in V1. They're much smaller and looking a little bit more regular in V2. Um, V3, they're still a little bit pointy. And then by the time you're looking at V4, 5, and 6, you're kind of getting that um, uh, monophasic, nice round looking uh, P waves. So just keep that in mind that we do have P waves um, and uh, they are prominent predominantly in V1 um, that we said about looking here. So keep that in mind. Next thing we're going to look at is our QRS complexes and looking at it. I mean, I know this is it the highest quality ECG, but you're looking at it and it looks like a, like a, a needle point, you know, like so you know that you are getting nice narrow QRS complexes um, that are normal. But again, uh, we don't talk about our QRS morphology within the normal range of, of a narrow peak, but these are um, much taller. We don't talk a lot about our voltage, but these are much taller than uh, you would expect 
uh, to C for um, R waves in your QRS, and that's predominantly happening uh, again in V1 and a little uh, V1, and then you're having um, in V2 and 3, you kind of have these really l like like these um, very low um, kind of long S waves occurring as well. So keep that in mind um, in addition, but uh, we do have a nice normal P wave, definitely less than 120 milliseconds. Um, sorry, QRS complex less than 120 milliseconds, but it is um, very tall um, and peaked R waves in V1 and similarly very kind of high voltage um, R waves in, or S waves in V2. Uh, moving on to our PR interval, uh, a little bit tricky, but we'll try and get at it with um, our, our rhythm strip down here just to see if the PR interval at least looks normal or if it looks prolonged or whatever it may be. Um, and I'll just zoom in here, and this one looks like not a bad one to zone in on. Uh, this is just the beginning of the P wave there. The de first negative deflection of our QRS is actually happening here, and it's really kind of hard to actually count uh, out how many um, boxes this is, but, you know, if you're thinking this whole thing is a big box, so you're definitely coming in at less than uh, 200 milliseconds, which is uh, our ideal... Um, uh, our ideal range for a PR interval, you might say that this is maybe between three and four small boxes, so somewhere in the range of 120 to 160 milliseconds, which is perfectly fine uh, for our PR interval. And last but not least, we're going to zoom out and kind of look more globally at our ST segments. I like to start uh, with the chest leads, and um, looking here, and I'm seeing kind of the ST segment hitting the isoelectric point in V1. Again, in V2, there's no evidence of elevation and depression. Looking again across V3, 4, 5, and 6, uh, everything looks nice there. And then our limb leads, um, you're kind of seeing the same pattern, so no evidence of elevation or depression um, in the ST segment. All right, so... Let's review those findings. So we said that we had a rate of 126 beats per minute that we uh, calculated with the 10 second method. This is a normal sinus rhythm. Um, the P waves are present and they are all followed by QRS complexes, but you want to recall that we had those really prominent P waves that looked really sharp um, and kind of pointy, kind of like this um, in, the, in V1. Uh, QRS complexes were also uh, normal and narrow, but you had those really very tall um, QRS com or R waves in your QRS complex in V1 as well, which you should keep in mind. We had a normal PR interval somewhere between 120 and 160 milliseconds, but definitely less than five small boxes. So that's all well and good. And then no signs of uh, elevation or depression in our ST segment across the board. Uh, so some other findings that, uh, additional uh, uh, findings in our interpretation, um, we'll just kind of explain this going into, you know, what is this, this ECG? Um, I'll tell you now, if you haven't figured it out from the history, uh, this is Tetralogy of Fallot. Um, in, in a baby. Uh, and I think um, the, the what we're pointing out here uh, it present in some of our uh, interpretation there or our findings there in this later interpretation is when you have Tetralogy of Fallot, you're really looking at a, uh, a case of the ECG findings are significant for right ventricular hypertrophy. Um, and that's kind of the key finding here. Um, I can go back to the ECG and point some of uh, what this means out, but uh, you want to think uh, when you're thinking of uh, right ventricular hypertrophy, there's a couple of diagnostic uh, findings you'll have. Uh, one of them is right axis deviation uh, greater than uh, 100, 110 degrees or more. Uh, dominant R waves in V1, dominant S waves in V5 or V6. And then you have a narrow QRS complex. So some of these may uh, mimic la, uh, a bundle branch block, um, but <clears throat> this is not a bundle branch block because our QRS uh, complex was normal. Now, 
uh, if I'm just going to go back to your ECG for a second here just to show you what does um, the right axis deviation might be your first diagnostic clue to right ventricular hypertrophy. So when we're talking about axis deviation, the leads that we're focusing on predominantly are lead one here um, and AVF. Um, <laughs> AVF. Um, I think this is supposed to be AVF, but what you're going to see in lead one is um, a predominant negative deflection in the QRS. This is still the S wave, right? This is the R, R peak and this is the S wave, but normally in lead one, you have a mostly positive deflection uh, and this is kind of flipped around where you have a majority negative deflection in that. Um, and the AV, uh, F also usually is predominantly positive. Um, and you can see this is predominantly po a positive deflection in your R wave or your QRS complex. So that's going to point you in the direction of right axis deviation, uh, which is going to be a common finding in your uh, anything that causes right ventricular hypertrophy. Um, and like we said, again, you're going to have that... Um, Dominant R waves in V1, which we saw those really tall peaked R waves that we mentioned before. You might see kind of big S waves in V5 and V6. And I think we do, yeah, uh, we do have uh, V5 and V6 here and here. You have these S waves normally for uh, the, um, the range you're going to hit for those R and S waves in your chest leads is greater than seven millimeters of height in your ECG. So that's the voltage. It's an increased voltage in that in that um, deflection. So for both of those, um, you could count it out if you want, but you can see like this is much lar larger than uh, seven boxes uh, uh, above the isoelectric line. And similarly, like this is just a little bit longer than seven boxes below. Um, so that is another uh, indication of your right ventricular hypertrophy. Um, uh, and then you'll have, uh, you may also have supplementary findings like left atrial enlargement uh, or what we call P pulmonale. And that's the peaked, we, we mentioned that we saw that the peaked P waves, they'll be greater than um, uh, 2.5 millimeters in amplitude uh, and you'll see that in the inferior leads, but we saw we also saw the peaked P waves in in V one here. It started actually, um, and that is a finding for your right atrial enlargement. Um, other things you may find are ST depression and T wave inversion in your right uh, precordial leads and your inf your right precordial and your inferior leads, and that's a right ventricular strain pattern. Um, and then a far right axis deviation with um, dominant S waves in leads one, two, and three, or deep S waves in your lateral leads, which are five, six, one, lead one, and AVL. Uh, so that is uh, just a little bit of your ECG pattern um, there, but let's talk a little bit more about tetralogy of Fallot. Um, tetralogy of Fallot is a conotruncal defect resulting from anterior malalignment of the infundibular septum. So this is, falls into the category of te or congenital heart disease. Uh, this, uh, the uh, morphology or the disease or the uh, pathology that we call tetralogy of Fallot is actually really for um, it has four components, uh, and those comp components are listed out here. There's a VSD, um, overriding of the aorta, narrowing of the, um, the right ventricular outflow tract, or you can hear the invendibular, um, the invendibular, uh, and then right ventricular hypertrophy is also a finding, and that's really what we're seeing predominantly in our in our ECG or the findings of right ventricular hypertrophy. Um, some causes of TOF, maternal diabetes, uh, retinoic acid exposure, um, PKU um, in the mother, um, and then you can also have it associated with some chromosomal defects. This is a 21Q11 deletion, um, uh, which is associated with some um, uh, chromosomal trisomies. Uh, so you might get that as well. Uh, we mentioned that you're going to have a finding of right axis deviation, and that's kind of secondary to your right ventricular hypertrophy. Um, and um, 
and it graded in 110 degrees as well. So this is just kind of zooming in on if you're between 100 and plus 120 to plus or minus 150, uh, that might be, uh, that presents in cyanotic to TOF. And then again, right ventricular hypertrophy is going to be present and you can match, uh, catch that on your ECG. Um, but, you know, on chest x-ray, things might look normal, normal sized heart, um, but you might have some uh, odd kind of pa pathology in the uh, pulmonary artery um, and down in the, the upturned apex. So look out for that on your chest x-ray. This is often called a boot-shaped heart, so you'll see that on board exams and in question stems to kind of like give you a hint um, as to what the pathology is there. But uh, what is really going to be diagnostic here because your ECG is not going to tell you the answer right off the bat. You're really going to have to go off of um, the history from the mother um, uh, and that will kind of be periodic cyanosis if the baby is exerting itself, either crying or feeding. Um, you'll start to kind of get blue per fingers or signs of peripheral cyanosis um, on exertion, but you really need an echo to diagnose this properly. So uh, you can get an echo, which is going to show you a couple things. Uh, one uh, thing that you might see, remember we have kind of four findings, but one of them is your VSD. So what we're looking at here is this is your interventricular septum or um, part of your interventricular septum. Usually, of course, uh, it's going to divide things properly. This is the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle. And here you have this opening between the two. So this is your VSD, uh, your uh, ventricular septal defect. So that can be seen in your uh, long axis view of your echo. And you might also be able to see the overriding aorta. This one is not as clear, but uh, you can probably say the overriding aorta is, is showing up kind of here in this particular view. And that just means like there's a, uh, it's not really quite aligned with the left ventricle as it's meant to be. Um, uh, and so you can get the, that's another cause of the, the cyanosis. So you have your VSD, you have your overriding aorta, um, and then you can also use a, a different view in your short axis, which would give you a good view of the uh, pulmonary annulus and your pulmonary arteries and the branches. Um, looking at that, uh, and also you can use Doppler to check out your right ventricular outflow track to kind of see what... Uh, size you're working with in, in the uh, right ventricular outflow flow track. So like I mentioned before, children can suffer cyanotic spells uh, and then they can get uh, blue. Uh, lips and fingers may turn blue uh, if they exert themselves with crying or if they're feeding and they're not kind of constantly oxygenating. And then uh, the most important, the most, most, most important thing is that the degree of the right outflow track obstruction is the most important determinant of... Um, uh, prognosis for these babies that have TOF. Uh, just uh, going back a, a minute just to, to talk about other causes of uh, right ventricular hypertrophy because that's really what our ECG was showing this week. You can see the same diagnostic um, criteria I mentioned before in other uh, pa uh, pathologies and diseases, uh, mitral stenosis, pulmonary embolism, uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, any patient with chronic lung disease that's progressed to core pulmonale will have, uh, can have signs of right ventricular hypertrophy um, and arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy may also be uh, a cause of RVH. Uh, and then those classic kind of diagnostic ECG findings would be present. Uh, let's talk management. Uh, so uh, it's important that uh, again, right, that you kind of assess the prognosis of the baby um, for what they need. Supportive measurements can be performed by patients and caregivers. So one thing that helps is holding the knees to the chest, which increases systemic resistance um, and reduces the shunting of blood from the right to the left. So it's going to reduce that kind of like cyanotic um, shunting occurring. Um, and anything that, and then keeping the child calm, of course, remember we said if the child's crying or uh, getting kind of agitated, like that can lead to cyanotic spells. So keeping them calm is kind of major. Uh, oxygen is important. Uh, pain management um, or use of morphine uh, to reduce 
uh, pulmonary vascular resistance is also uh, a good thing. Re- remember, we have that right ventricular outflow tract um, uh, narrowing. So uh, by decreasing pulmonary vascular resistance, you know, you're helping w- reduce some of that uh, resistance in going through the right ventricular outflow tract. Phenylephrine, which is an alpha-1 adrenergic receptor agonist, can be used uh, which increases your systemic vascular resistance and then promotes blood flow. That promotes blood flow through the pulmonary trunk, and, and that's going to um, uh, promote oxygenation and reduce uh, the risk of, of cyanosis. Um, and most babies um, will get this surgically fixed um, um, within the first year or, or two years, so you can um, uh, have... Um, surgery to kind of correct the those four kind of aspects of the tetralogy to kind of recreate uh, a normal kind of functioning heart that doesn't have uh, the risk, the high risk of cyanosis uh, that the t- uh, TOF presents with. Uh, so, uh, yep, there it is. Uh, surgical repair um, can take place within a few months, uh, sometimes within a few years. Usually this is uh, closing the VSD um, and then enlarging uh, the right ventricular outflow tract, remember that is kind of the most uh, important uh, aspect to the prognosis. Um, uh, and it, often, you know, these babies aren't kind of one and done to surgeries uh, and they can, you know, need to have follow-up surgeries and get pulmonary valve replacement later in life. But once the VSD and the outflow tract are kind of fixed up, at least you can um, send the child home and they'll be pretty okay. Um, and it's important that, um, preoperatively these children, like before they go into surgery, they get, um, prophylaxis for infective endocarditis. Um, and then they kind of continue that, uh, antibiotic, uh, for six months postoperatively. Uh, so, um, that's just an important other note in the management, uh, to consider. So what are our main takeaways? Well, tetralogy flow, we know, is a congenital heart disease with four components, ventricular septal defect, aortic valve over or overriding aorta, narrowing of the right ventricular outflow tract, and the right ventricular hypertrophy. And again, this right ventricular hypertrophy is what we're seeing on the ECG with those diagnostic findings, right axis deviation, um, greater than 110 degrees, um, with the um, tall R waves in V one um, and tall and large S enlarged S waves in V five and six, uh, and then um, but a normal QR restoration so that the changes are not due to a bundle branch block. Uh, also look out for right atrial enlargement, which is looking at kind of peaked enlarged P waves. Um, sometimes you'll find those in the inferior leads and, uh, that's kind of your ECG giveaway. Um, uh, on radiology, chest x-ray would show a boot-shaped heart. Uh, echocardiogram, uh, is, di- is going to be needed for, uh, the gold standard diagnostic for that. Um, and you're going to be able to see the, some of the components of, of your tetralogy, your VSD, your overriding aorta and what has it. Uh, check, uh, watch out for cyanotic spells if the child is agitated or cries or uh, isn't oxygenating well. Uh, you want to make sure that you re- minimize those activities to reduce the risk of cyanosis. And of course, management for long-term survival is, is possible with surgical intervention. So uh, thank you everybody for another great week. We uh, will keep churning out some interesting and fun educational cases for you. Uh, if you need any refreshers on the reading ECGs and interpreting them, you can check out our YouTube page where you'll find tons, tons, tons more videos to watch, other interesting ECGs, and of course, our refresher course, um, uh, just to remind yourself of the six steps and kind of where to look and what you're looking for.